Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it's a pleasure. We are really excited to share the input from all, I mean, many centers from the uh, MIT Global Scale uh, Network. We are going to talk today about AI-driven uh, supply chains. So let me share the screen so then we can um, elaborate a little bit uh, a little bit more. I hope that then you can see my slides. Can you? Great, so thank you. So uh, today, again, we have a great um, set of panelists here that they, we are gonna share our latest research in, in the area of uh, applications of AI in supply chain management. Actually, we wanted to emphasize that they are all applications. We wanted to, to, to show you that, again, AI is a reality uh, in today's uh, landscape of supply chain and, and operations. Let me introduce the panelists that we are going to have today. Let's just start first with uh, Yasel Costa. Yasel is an uh, industrial engineer from, um, from the University of Martindale. And uh, then he obtained his doctor degree from the prestigious German institution Otto von Gurich. So I mean, I can't pronounce it <laughs> well. Uh, and then he research interest in covers a variety of diverse I mean, topics, um, supply chain network design, sustainable operations, green vehicle routing problems. Also, he is director of the PhD program uh, of Zaragoza Logistics Center. Uh, Zaragoza Logistics Center is our first center that created the core uh, of the MIT Global Scale Network. Welcome, Yasel. So the Thank next you. panel is, um, let, let me see if I am okay pronouncing it, Chel Kagjit. Huh? So we are glad to have you here, Chel, uh, it's, it's great. So she is Assistant Professor of the Luxembourg Center for Logistics and Supply Chain Management at University of Luxembourg. Her research focuses on optimization under uncertainty, applications uh, uh, and uh, policy design, learning optimization, especially for resource allocation, fairness, and equities. Very exciting uh, topics. Huh? She is a PhD uh, from uh, the Cold Polytechnic Federal of Lausanne. Yeah. So yeah, this is a great panel here. Um, I, will, I will introduce myself as well. My name is Maria Jesus Sainz. Uh, I am the director of the MIT Digital Supply Chain Transformation Laboratory um, and also uh, the executive director of the MIT Supply Chain Management Master's Program. Um, I have been um, working for Global Scale Network since 2003. Actually, uh, I was at Zaragoza Logistic Center, so I know very well the, the Global Scale Network and particularly I'm very proud of of what we are doing there just to, to shape the future of, of supply chains. Okay, so let me, before starting, let me share what the MIT Global Scale Network is. We are a set of centers all over the world, actually then, then um, we at MIT are here and also Saragossa Logistics Center, Luxembourg, but also we have the uh, Nimbo um, Supply Chain Center in China, also, we have uh, CLI in uh, Colombia, but it's a network of universities and, and uh, institutions uh, all over Latin America. In total, these are our figures. We have more than 10 educational programs, master's degrees, uh, executive education certificates, more than 80 researchers and faculty from all over the world with a variety of topics, all of us working in logistics and supply chain, we, our main, main, let's say, uh, feature is that we, all of us, we are doing applied research. We want to shape the future of supply chain. So this is why we work with more than 150 corporate partnerships. Huh? Um, uh, every year we are educating more than 200 students. And then we have a rich uh, network of alumni uh, from all over the world that are super committed. Uh, and they are coming to MIT uh, every single year here in general. Um, so then with that, I also, before starting, I wanted to emphasize that we have a lot of different events. Just in a couple of hours, 11 a.m. today, we have uh, Dr. Christopher Mejia talking about social driven supply chain network design. Uh, so how AI can help to bring uh, nutrition to under underserved 
communities. But please go to um, CTL event website. We have there, for example, the POMS conference in Latin America. We have our annual event, CTL, MIT CTL event, annual event, Crossroads. Go there to CTL events and then please register. Um, we'd love to share all, all our, um, I mean, insights with, with all of you and discuss um, your, your challenges and opportunities with us. Okay. So then we have one hour. So then we, we need to go um, with the clock very carefully. This is our panel dynamics. We have these short introductions. Then we are going to have three case studies. I told you, we want to make it very fractional oriented, very actionable. Huh? Then so we are going to have, I'm going to start talking how Dell uh, is leading right now. We are working with Dell closely. How is leading supply chain using AI in, in different uh, topics, especially end-to-end -end, uh, planning. Then a uh, second case study will be with Dr. Dr. Jason Costa from Saragossa Logistics Center, as I mentioned. Uh, he will talk about bio-inspired AI in the optimization of delivery roads at Samsonite. So again, we are bringing to your companies just to illustrate that this is a reality. And the third case study is by um, Cheryl Kojidik about data-driven decisions with AI. We will talk about uh, especially efficiency and interpretability. And what are the trade-offs between two key words for AI, efficiency and interpretability? I love it. And then we will have a panel discussions with you. So the dynamics is that then you are introducing your questions in the in the uh, in the uh, chat to Q and A, and then we will moderate. We will read all this in order to bring the questions. Um, and I would say the the last uh, twenty five minutes. We want to have time for having discussion with you. And huh? so this is we are going to try to be short in our presentations. So then uh, let's start. Huh? Let's start. Uh, I mean, some weeks ago here at MIT CTL, all the researchers, uh, around 60 researchers, we sit together for almost yeah, two hours just to discuss what is artificial intelligence? What do we understand by artificial intelligence? And yeah, the, the, the beauty of that is that we couldn't agree. We couldn't get a consensus of one single definition of AI. This makes sense. Why? Because then AI could be interpreted as an aspiration about what could be. Huh? So it's very important for whatever kind of application of AI that we are doing, that we um, define in advance, what do we interpret by AI? And this is why here with Jason and Jill, that we decided to agree what kind of definition of AI or what kind of focal point we are putting um, uh, in AI for the three applications that we are going to share with you. And this is what we think that could be a good um, understanding of AI for the purpose of today's webinar. I am sure that you have other definitions in your applications, and it's totally okay. Please don't interpret that this is their definition. We don't want to, 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 to mean, we don't want to bring here their definition because now the application is so broad uh, that, yeah, I mean, then uh, Zoom is, is helping me with that. <laughs> this is great. Then again, uh, the AI is so broad that then it is difficult to have one single definition. So this is what we understand for the purpose of this webinar. Huh? Then uh, can be defined an, uh, an, uh, the ability of a machine, an algorithm, a technology uh, to perform cognitive functions associated with human minds, such as perceiving. Learning, we are emphasizing learning because the three of us, we are going to emphasize how AI is helping us to learn. Helping us means this, the, the organizations that are using applying AI. Interacting with the environment, problem solving, um, and uh, interpreting among others. So I will start with how then is interpreting AI. And I want to be quite quick because then we want to be agile with our webinar. Then um, let's start what, what we understood about AI-driven digital supply chain transformation. And then we consider what Dell did here. Um, it's much more complex than just renewing technology or renewing algorithms or, or translating, I mean, processes into algorithms. It's, I mean, much more than that. And then we will be the Dell case. So let me start. This is the definition that here in the digital uh, supply chain transformation lab at MIT, what we, we, we understand about AI driven supply chain, then uh, especially transformation, is the application of AI as a technology. Huh? And then it could be algorithms, could be, uh, I mean, um, 
uh, cobots or robots uh, that are driven by AI algorithms, that then we use data to transition towards value-driven end-to-end supply chain. If I had to highlight here two key words, are value, and value is something that you expect, and sometimes AI helps us to discover, huh? and then uh, driven end-to-end -end supply chain. End-to-end -end is an aim, it's a goal, and then, uh, yeah, only a few companies are really doing end-to-end, -end. but let's see how Dell is doing end-to-end. -end. What we have observed uh, in the uh, in the companies is that, um, I mean, there is different challenges and difficulties for applying AI, especially end-to-end, -end, huh? and then, it is much more complex. And then first we, we observe the challenge of the Frankenstein effect. Then, okay, you are having different components of AI. One AI is uh, in the last mile delivery. Typically one AI is in uh, in forecasting. Huh? And they are not talking to each other. So then they are like isolated pieces that need to be polished and polished and polished in order to have a more uh, cohesive view of AI. This is a journey. It's not something that happens in, in, in even in months. It will require years. I will share what Dell is doing. Dell is working with this kind of approach for, um, I will say, five years right now. Ah, they continue working with this vision. Hmm? Then not only Frankenstein effect, but also there are other issues or challenges. Technocentrism is when um, a company then focus too much on technology. Eh? then everything is focused on technology. Let's translate, I mean, the way of optimizing my cost in last mile delivery, uh, according to how right now I am running my last mile delivery. Wrong. Because the idea will be to envision how you want to do the last mile delivery, and then develop the algorithm for this future vision, hmm? instead of just only translating what you are doing right now. Hmm? So technology can help you in order to, 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 help, to, to, to be more efficient. But then the focal point is not on technology. What technology can do for me? The focal point is, I mean, how do I envision my, my last mile delivery process? And then how technology, AI can help me. It's a, it's a completely different vision. Um, uh, and then you will achieve more with focusing on, the, on that vision. And scalability. So companies sometimes, they, um, they uh, make pilot um, prototypes of uh, AI applications. This is great, but typically this is based on very highly motivated people with um, um, very clean and available and granular data. Uh, this is a perfect data set. When you go to reality, the, all these components are not so easy to get. So this is why it's important that the companies have the um, the capability of scaling up, of being able to do prototyping and then moving the prototyping to a scale up to more regions, to more processes, to more SKUs, et cetera. So the, the lack of scalability capability uh, is, 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 is a problem. And then we have observed that the more successful companies, especially with AI, they are comfortable exploring, experimenting, and scaling this up. Uh, and then the, this, is, this is very important. Uh. So, um, then uh, let, let's talk about Dell. Dell was working, they started their digital supply chain transformation journey in 2017. Then they were asking what technology can do for me. And they discovered that then they should uh, focus on their vision, focus on their strategy and their expectation, performance expectation. And actually they developed these five experience. Let's focus on particularly this one, make the right commitment. Let me, let me explain how they deployed AI, and especially how they connect with, I mean, leadership and vision and strategy with the performance as an anchor point to make, I mean, uh, AI scale uh, up. Huh? This is the idea, make the right commitment. Make the right commitment for them was to put a um, commitment in the North Star of their vision. Hmm? Commitment beforehand, so when, when they commit with a, with a customer, let's say 100 laptops for a retailer. Yeah, but then we can deliver in, let's say, four days. Huh? So this is a commitment that they established in advance. Huh? Then they can monitor the commitment, the order end to end. Hmm? And then they also, after the fact, they can go and then they can monitor what is going, what could be going on, this forward looking approach, this future approach. Uh, analyzing with AI uh, root cause analysis, for example. Mm -hmm. 
So then this approach of before the order, during the order, after the order is very powerful, especially knowing how to anchor, what is the expected performance that is commitment of with an order end to end. This is very, very powerful. So then AI, sorry, uh, Dell made this kind of loop with AI. But this is really, really interesting in terms of how they measure performance, both of, I mean, the business, how AI is impacting the business. And second, how they are scaling this up, how they are expanding the reach and the effect of AI. First, they started with value identification. So then in these cases was commitment. So this is a North Star where we defined AA driven supply chain transformation, the value expectation is in commitment. They wanted to measure to quantify commitment. Hmm? Also, they wanted to, um, to uh, quantify this commitment with a KPI. And uh, they developed a KPI that is aimed to be end to end. This KPI is perfect order index. So it's the percentage that every element of the order aimed end to end, let's say for example, logistic service provider that is preparing an order, what is the percentage of the time that they are under the expected commitment, eh? under the committed commitment, let's say. Eh? So the perfect order in this is very end to end. So because then you deploy the different components of the order while preparing, but also in advance eh? and then forward looking. Mm -hmm. So then uh, this is the way they quantified the value uh, in terms of a KPI that is perfect of the index. It's not only a simple on time in full, because what they were doing is just, I mean, uh, uh, splitting into different components mm -hmm. uh, from the stakeholders that are participating. Value creation is what the key learning indicators, how, what they are learning, how they are activating these loops, how they are scaling this up, how they are progressing with artificial intelligence. You remember AI learns or is expected to learn. So key learning indicator is important. Is for example, the Delta, how we increase perfect order index or maybe how we decrease, or we've had a problem with this logistic service provider. They made, um, uh, I mean, they, they made a delay. So they are decreasing why this happened. So the decrease in POI should trigger some root cause analysis, why this happened just to avoid that this will happen in the future. A net promoter score is another typical key ally. Then they need to transform all these in money, of course, money is important. And then just to map the uh, AI money map, right? in end to end, what are the different um, uh, impact of, uh, of perfect order index? Right? If we have um, change in the commitment, how this could change into um, losing money huh? or or the opposite, if we are improving, how we are saving. And value appropriation is very important. We are talking about supply chain. So then how we incentivize our stakeholders, for example, suppliers, or this logistic service provider that is always on time as expected because we perf we monitor his contribution to, perform uh, to perfect order index, to POI, and how we incentivize this attachment to commitment, and then the loop starts again. Huh? AI is present in several facets here. Hmm? So then uh, AI is present before making the commitment because we predict the capabilities during the commitment because we are executing uh, in real time what kind of uh, prescriptive uh, actions we can take. Huh? And also after the order, because we can say what are the future scenarios with root cause analysis. Huh? So all these predictive capabilities, for example, with uh, forecasting demand, of course, but forecasting lead time, root cause, et cetera. And also, for example, with resilience, monitoring the risks behind, thinking ahead. Huh? With that, uh, I am finishing. Yeah, I told you, we wanted to be quick, dynamic. We wanted to make sure that then uh, you are engaged. Let's go to the uh, second case. Uh, Dr. Jessel Costa. Doctor, ready? Ready, yes. Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Excellent. So thank you so much, Maria. I'm so glad to be here uh, joining you guys. I've been learning a lot from your presentation. Um, I do have another definition of AI. 
is certainly not science fiction, right? And I, I, I do like that word about learning. Um, we consider that AI, it's constantly learning from different kind of sources, some kind of creative learning, right? And this is exactly the point of my presentation today, but in a better applied context. Um, so when, when you double check sometimes the different uh, AI-based uh, algorithmic proposals, they are already linked with these two fields, according to my understanding, mostly related to knowledge discovery, and um, but very few applications in the context of optimization as a, the traditional problem sharing, for instance. Um, and, and, and this learning that I mentioned has to be basically with the natural inspiration. Uh, when we learn from nature, we uh, get uh, an abstract, the most creative uh, knowledge. And um, for that, we have been using that repeatedly since, I don't know, ancient time. And uh, for different industry, of course, uh, we talk about manufacturing sector, biological sector, pharmaceutical sector, right? And from that learning, of course, uh, we have some uh, many, uh, I would say, um, application context. In the field of knowledge discovery, for instance, one of the most famous one has to be the neural networks, right? Uh, that natural inspiration related to, uh, to the biological uh, or the bio bioelectricity that flows through our brain. And of course, we just want to understand what's better, what's the better output considered multiple inputs. So when we compare that with the traditional regression analysis, so AI-based uh, algorithms simply uh, it's simply superior, right? And I would say that the most eff effective AI applications uh, they all have natural inspiration or bio-inspired um, um, source, right? So in, in in many of the cases, uh, when we heard and um, get excited about chat GPT, so what we do we have right behind uh, the algorithm of chat GPT, it's clear. So there are multiple kind of neural networks trained with billions and billions on, on cases with the knowledge base. Uh, so uh, that's, that's there where you see constantly multiple application of artificial intelligence and particularly by inspired algorithmic proposals, right? So, but this is not all. Um, there are many other application contexts where we could see um, different source of natural inspiration. And well, this is very uh, well known, uh, like the uh, evolutionary uh, algorithm, and particularly the first one proposed uh, genetic algorithm, uh, all inspired in the evolution of the species where the most adapted individuals, they, they prevail, right? So in our case, there's not individual anymore when I, try to put this into uh, you know the context of logistics so it can be seen like a, a, a distribution uh, a problem where we uh, I don't know we take two different solutions and then we uh, cross this solution in order to get a more a, a better adaptive solution in our context that will mean uh, less uh, travel, travel distance right and for instance for this particular one we had patterns that they have like, uh, four uh, vehicles for the fleet size and this one it has like a three and then we have like a better adapted solution with better total travel uh, time and, and in that case we have like a fleet size equal to three. This is what we were trying to do but with a different source of inspiration and this, this algorithm is also well known and it's truly inspired on <clears throat> um, the behaviors of the real ants where they are constantly find the shorter path between the nest and the source of food. And of course, uh, also artificial intelligence in this context reveal a nice feature, which is, you know, the swarm intelligence. So a single ant, it's uh, basically, uh, doesn't matter if it is real or artificial ant, makes uh, a random uh, selection of the path here. So we clearly see that the shortest path is this one. So once there is an ant that realize or randomly select this uh, shorter path, then uh, it, it lets this uh, trail of pheromone. And of course the next ant will uh, take that uh, trail where you know the pheromone smell is emphasized uh, somehow. So that kind of uh, collective or uh, what is called technically swarm intelligence help us a lot to solve transportation problem like for instance could be described uh, according to this um, 
according to this uh, matrix here. And of course, if we have multiple ants departing from different cells here and then following all the subsequent stitches, then we explore greater area within the solution space. Solution space that traditionally describes transportation problems, as resource assignment problems, um, even the one that Maria was mentioning, the forecasting problems in that field of knowledge discovering. So we use that inspiration to solve a realistic problem. In this case, the problem was set up in Chile and Santiago de Chile particularly. And um, um, this problem um, um, uh, was about a, a daily uh, delivery process uh, when we had uh, 350 customer geographically spread and that's it I mentioned. And there was a 3PL that basically was uh, hired for doing that delivery, product deliveries in the last mile context. And um, in that regard, they charge money based on, you know, the fleet size. And um, they got a um, homogeneous fleet of vehicles, of course, where um, traditionally it's called like different capacity, uh, vehicles with different capacity. And it was very challenging. Why? Because you know, when they made a contract with the customer, the, uh, the customer clearly emphasized about one of the most difficult constraints in this problem setting, and it's about the time windows, right? So when we have very tight uh, time windows, um, that impose a very hard constraint to the optimization process. And um, sometimes it makes, when you have demand peaks during the day, so customers that you wouldn't imagine, then the problem is not anymore only in stochastic, it's also a problem with a dynamic structure, like the so-called dynamic vehicle routing problem where the where the customers appears and disappears, and therefore the structure of the problem change over the, the planning horizons, right? And of course, at the moment this was um, uh, examined, uh, there was uh, a manual schedule of the process, which definitely takes a lot of time, uh, not even a reasonable time for performing a very operational decision, right? So um, that's pretty much uh, the idea with the problem. Uh, and uh, well, uh, there were certainly penalties when they were late they rebased, and of course that that imply uh, most of the time delays. And we were talking about a problem that is uh, that is actually not considered a, a, a small scale problem in the field of BRPs. Uh, in the field of BRPs, uh, more than fifty nodes or more than um, um, yeah, uh, fifty customers that. For, for which we should deliver something that is considered a, a problem with uh, substantial complexity, right? So this is the way it looks, uh, uh, one day uh, delivery. So as, as, as I mentioned, the 3PL charge based on the fleet size and many other things, but particularly the fleet size. So uh, this was at uh, Adiwas for the business, um, how they made the decision and it took eight trucks to, uh, you know, to complete that workload they had at the moment. But when we were using our ant colony optimization, AI inspired, then we reduced the fleet size by 50%, right? Uh, not to mention that there was also a substantial reduction in terms of the total total cost, transportation cost, right? Like about 38%. So um, before my time is about to <laughs> be gone. So this is a summary for more days of, uh, you know, road planning and in, and totally just in just just in 10 days we could actually save like 24 um, uh, percent some cost metric I, I i don't have time to mention what it was about and um substantial reduction also in terms of the fleet size and one of the most important reduction was that i mean compared with uh, exact methods that uh, mostly find the optimal solution we uh, reduce substantially of course the computational time um, and compare even to the traditional uh, time that they were using for, or the frequently the time they were used to schedule the vehicles, then it was also a substantial reduction. So this is one example of how, you know, uh, by inspired methods could be applied with a very frequent problem uh, in, in the logistical context, which is, for instance, in this case, transportation. So I hope you like it and uh, hand it over to my dear colleague. And thank you very much, Maria. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Thank you, Yesel. Yeah. Great Do you time. see my slides? Yes. Mm. Thank you. Can I just uh, start? It's fine. 
Hello, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, the interplay between efficiency and interpretability when considering data-driven decisions with AI. Even though there is typically a trade-off between efficiency and interpretability of AI decisions, uh, I'm going to show you that achieving both efficiency and interpretability simultaneously can be uh, possible in practice by discussing a recent project of mine and my collaborators. The project that I'm going to discuss is not directly related to supply chains or logistics, but it's a resource allocation problem. And I'm going to uh, argue that a similar data-driven solution approach uh, can be used for other resource and capacity allocation problems, including, including those that arise in, in supply chains and logistics. Okay, so when we talk about decisions, uh, including decisions, uh, data-driven decisions with AI, we uh, want them to be both efficient and interpretable. Efficiency typically involves maximizing payoffs while minimizing costs. And interpretability means that humans uh, can understand and explain how decisions are made. To emphasize, the interpretability is not just about understanding the models used, it is important to understand the decisions themselves. This is important in practice because this allows us to trust the decisions made by the models, making their implementation easier for us. Actually, in my interactions with uh, practitioners from various fields, including healthcare, logistics, and energy, this desire for interpretability emerges uh, as a common, common theme. Practitioners always express that they do not want decisions made by a black box. They want to understand the decision-making process. Besides enabling trust, interpretability is also important for human-machine collaboration, which is arguably safer than relying solely on machine-made decisions. So if humans can understand the decisions, they can make adjustments as needed. Efficiency of AI is unquestionable from my point of view, but interpretability raises concerns. For example, you may be aware of that there are some ongoing lawsuits against various institutions, including some law firms and banks in the US, raising concerns about AI made decisions, uh, allegedly discriminating people based on protected features such as race. It is really important to understand the decisions and proactively prevent any potential discrimination or ethical issue. There is typically a trade-off between efficiency and interpretability of AI decisions. The more advanced the model that you use, it tends to offer better decisions. But on the other hand, more advanced models and uh, their decisions, for example, you could consider um, models such as gradient boosting and neural networks for forecasting. These are less interpretable than compared to simpler models such as linear regression or decision trees. In, in the remainder of my talk, I'm going to talk about a recent project of mine focusing on learning policies for allocating scarce housing resources to people experiencing homelessness in LA. This uh, project that I'm going to talk about isn't directly about supply chains or logistics, but uh, I'm going to argue that the solution approach can actually be applied to other uh, resource and capacity allocation problems. And uh, actually we are implementing, we are trying to establish a similar data-driven uh, solution framework for freight uh, shipping revenue management at the moment. Okay, so the work I'm going to talk about is inspired by housing allocation for individuals experiencing homelessness in LA County. According to the Los Angeles uh, Homeless Services Authority, LASA, there are more than 75,000 people experiencing homelessness in LA, whereas the availability of permanent housing units used for supporting these people is extremely limited. LASA currently uses a, a vulnerability tool to decide on how to prioritize people for different housing resource types. When an individual seeks help, a survey for this individual is completed, and this survey contains questions such as uh, how long has it been since you lived in a stable housing? These survey responses are then used to calculate a vulnerability score for each individual and to make decisions about prioritization. 
Unfortunately, the current system is not linked to outcomes nor to capacity limitations. Our objective in this project is to use the data that is already there, specifically the data from the LA County Homeless Management Information System database, to learn optimal policies for online allocation of scarce housing resources to people experiencing homelessness, maximizing outcomes, specifically maximizing the exits from homelessness, while considering capacity limitations and fairness with respect to protected features such as race. We propose a very simple queuing policy. This policy establishes separate queues for each of the housing resource types. When an individual arrives to the system and seeks help, this policy assigns the individual to the queue for the resource that maximizes their estimated likelihood of exiting homelessness if they receive that particular resource, minus the opportunity cost of assigning that resource. Here, the likelihoods and opportunity cost, we estimate them from the data that we have. And we can use interpretable parametric uh, models such as logistic regression for estimating the likelihoods, for example. And we showed on real data this type of models actually perform well. And to ensure different notions of fairness, we can actually adjust the opportunity cost for different groups, for example, lowering this cost for minority groups. We actually managed to prove theoretically that our proposed policy is optimal in the long run, meaning that as the number of individuals arriving to the system grows. But I'm going to show you our results on the real data, because we tested our policy also on the real data. This plot here shows the proportion of the population with a positive outcome, specifically the proportion that exits homelessness on test data under historical allocations and under our proposed policy. Outcome minority priority here represents our proposed policy where we enforce fairness for outcomes. This means that we want outcomes for minority racial groups to be as high as those for the majority racial groups. And in this case, we consider Black, African, American, Hispanic, and other to be minority groups. What you can see from this plot is that under our proposed policy, outcomes for almost every group improves in comparison to the historical allocations. And the overall improvement here roughly amounts to 300 more people exiting homelessness per year on the test data. Due to limited time, I can only give you a glimpse of our work and findings, but if you are interested, I want to share this QR code that would take you to our paper. In addition, I would like to mention that my co-author, Phoebe Vajanos, recently gave a TED AI talk on this topic. So if you are interested, I would encourage you to see her, the recording of her talk, which is available from the TED webpage. Okay, so to conclude, I presented to you a data-driven solution approach for resource allocation that is both efficient and interpretable. Even though the housing allocation problem isn't directly related to supply chains or logistics, this solution approach can actually be applied to other resource capacity allocation problems. And actually, the solution approach itself is inspired by bid price policies used in network revenue management. As I mentioned before, with actually with collaborators from SCL, we are currently uh, establishing a similar a solution approach for freight shipping revenue management. And I anticipate that this solution approach could incorporate some sustainability targets similar to fairness integration. For example, if we are talking about procurement or supplier selection, targets of the sort, uh, I want at least 25% of all purchased goods and services to come from green suppliers. This is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I would be happy to answer your questions during the discussion part. Thank you very much, uh, Yasel and Until. It has been great. Uh, uh, as a good logisticians, we are right on time, which is which is also great, and it shows our commitment. We have tons of questions, so then um, I'm going to try to go one to one. Let's try to be agile in answering, quick answering, so we can go to um, as much as we can. And and this is part of the of the idea of the webinar. Huh? 
So Dr. Costa from Sunita Bay, then she recommends your colony optimization and Python coding that you made at MIT some years ago. Thank you, Sunita. Best regards. Uh, then are there any more um, of these as popular as uh, this? Hmm? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, well, for the sake of simplicity and time saving, I did not present this here or the progress we had made, but we propose other variants where we explore more areas of the solution space. So to make it simple, we we have uh, other variants that, that examine uh, greater areas of the solution space and provide better solution quality because somebody, someone else was asking if it, that improved the CPLEX. Of course, it doesn't improve the CPLEX. This is exact uh, solution, but it was very close in many instances. It was very close to the absolute optimum. Uh, computational time was pretty much the same, although you think, okay, exploring more costs more time. No. So there, there have been a lot of improvements since, since that time. Thank you for that question. And glad you recalled my talk at the MIT. Mm -hmm. So um, an anonymous attendee, how can we prevent um, or filter bad data from the artificial intelligence? It is a threat to the AI. What can we do to undo it? Example for bad data could be a feedback loop. Look. So then who wants to answer this? Hmm. I could go and answer what I would do. <laughs> So basically, there are a lot of methods uh, in AI and machine learning uh, that deals with noisy and bad data uh, to robustify the solution uh, against uh, such uh, noisy data or bad data. Uh, one of the well-known methods is like regularization, use of regularization or robust optimization. So uh, there are available methods to prevent such cases. I think a priori, it would be difficult to say what is noisy or uh, bad. Uh, there are methods for doing that as well. Uh, but even if you are not able to tell, as I said, you could robustify your solution against certain uh, noise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, another question on Dell. So I think this is for me. How does pricing analytics interact or align with this end-to-end -end value chain? Will this happen uh, during sales and operation planning? And then pricing analytics is should be a component of the end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain. So if you have an order, at the end of the day, the order should have a predicted price. Hmm? In the it will be a, a price that is offering the commitment, and then also on forward looking, so in future then you can also predict how the price could change. Huh? So then it is, it's not purely a function of supply chain. It's more a function of marketing, commercial, et cetera. But definitely in order to measure the trade-offs with AI for cost to serve, you need to input this. Huh? Because then uh, this could create also some kind of distortions if the price is going to change based on unexpected, for example, commercial promotions. So then the forecasting should be able to understand why this is changing. Um, this is maybe changing for a kind of exogenous variable. So I don't know that maybe um, a computer in certain disruption will change the price. So then uh, this is an exogenous factor due to the exogenous disruption. So then as much you can grab in information that is exogenous to your supply chain, so let's say how the world is moving, how the warnings are doing over, over, over there that are not directly from the supply chain, the better you can create predictive capabilities with these exogenous factors that are coming from all over the world. It's a very general answer, but then you should input I mean, uh, um, prices, uh, price information into your, uh, your equation because it's the way of, of, of also monitor cost to serve traders, but pricing is not typically supply chain decision, right? Okay, the next one. Uh, then Julia Zhao, what is the difference between AI and data science for supply chain in your understanding? Wow, this is good. Jason, you want to answer that one? Mm -hmm. huh. Well, it's that's that's these are overlapping fields, honestly. I mean, uh, uh, data, data analytics in, in, in I mean, uh, Whatever you do in terms of knowledge discovering, which is for in, according to my understanding, 
the more comprehensive terminology, knowledge discovery in general. Uh, if you're using a neural network uh, or if you are using um, other kind of natural or not natural inspiration, you can use it in, in data in data analytics uh, for whatever kind of uh, application context in that field of uh, supply chain management. So maybe if you ask this question 10 years ago, then we will say that clearly for data analytics, then we have, uh, you know, um, we have regression analysis, we have the traditional, uh, more mathematical oriented. And in this case now for AI, then these are more computational oriented, right? Uh, but nowadays it's hard to discriminate. Yeah, you know, this is difficult. This is why at the beginning we define what we interpret with AI, how we deploy these cognitive functions, especially learning. I, I mean, does data science learn? Of course. <laughs> so then again, yeah. how to discriminate? This is why, I mean, mm -hmm. one single definition of AI, uh, that's not work. Sorry, I mean, then, then uh, is this not yes or not? Kind of, it depends how you apply. Whatever you are doing, whatever is going to impact your performance and then allows you to learn, to transform your supply chain, to be better or to test new business models, then yeah, this is good. Huh? Okay, um, next one. Um, then I think this is for me, my, uh, uh, then Amit Ray. Um, thank you, Amit. Uh, can you help to understand how AI helped to improve end-to-end -end visibility of Dell system? Traditionally, companies are using ERP and other systems for creating visibility. How AI can help it further? These are very good questions. And then ERP is playing a key role. But what we have observed in the most successful cases is that uh, uh, visibility is much more what you have internally in your ERP, much more than that. Hmm? I mean, advanced companies are using external signals, hmm? not only what are internal signals coming from your ERP, coming from... Uh, uh, your, um, let's say, manufacturing operations, but the external signals are coming from what is going on in the world that can help me to contextualize my actions for operations. So contextualization is another beautiful feature expected from AI, not only interpretability as, as we presented, but also contextualization. So then end-to-end -end visibility is not only internally within a URP. Let me put an example. There are some startups that are collecting intensively data using AI, knowledge graphs, natural language processing about what is going on with suppliers all over the world. So it's a real-time information. So for example, what are your ESG scores, uh, your sustainability scores? So then you can input in your system, in your internal system, whatever is the source, could be ERP or, I don't know, or, or, I mean, a procurement uh, tool, and then you incorporate this information from the current status of our current suppliers or maybe future suppliers hmm, in order to decide what will be the, my best set of suppliers. Hmm? For example, if I am running a new product, I am running, running a new business model or a new action in the market. Hmm? So then again, uh, uh, end visibility is much more than earpiece, uh, what we observe in the better companies. Or for example, end-to-end -end visibility is another uh, question that is over there in the in the chat, and is um, it, it was about um, uh, then how we could extract information from the bottom line that maybe we don't track. So there are some applications, beautiful applications based on AI and other startups that are beautiful work. Then, for example, they scan all the emails that you are doing with natural language processing, and they are extracting. What are the key insights from emails in order to enrich visibility? So then it's not purely data uh, that is a structure in your ERP or work management system or warehouse management system, transportation management system, whatever, is that then you are extracting the data hmm, that is not a structure. You are extracting the data from the decision makers, hmm, from emails, just for example, to feed up how to run a process or how to standardize a process. So again, it is, it is, it is, it is the, the beauty of AI that it can learn from a structure and from non-structured data. So this is the power that you can, again, transform, uh, I mean, all your decisions and all what's going on into, um, into the language of data. But then again, this for some companies could be um, science fiction, but for others is a reality. They are playing with these toys 
in order to make more and more end-to-end -end visibility, huh? okay? So let's go with the next one. Hugo Herrera, thanks, Hugo. At the company I'm currently working, we are going to implement a new demand and replenishment software that already incorporates AI algorithms. One of the challenges we face is that the maturity level of data is not what is expected for this type of software. Welcome to the world, mm -hmm. but it's in the same, right? Uh, how to achieve a match with the company's need to implement this type of software with a low readability of the data? So who wants to answer this question most about replenishment? Yeah. Mm. No? Uh, well, yes. I, I I, I just I just want I just want to say that uh, maybe it's somehow related with with that one, but there are many other questions that I I, I went through and and um uh, they were asking about the application for uh, of for instance the algorithm I propose um to other application contexts like inventory management or uh, resource allocation that you were mentioning Jill. um and uh, of course, um, whatever problem you can model as a network, for instance, the, the, the traditional ad column optimization can be used in that particular case too, for replenishment, for instance, too. Or there's even variance uh, with continuous optimization where you could uh, easily apply that. Uh, so it's, maybe it's not related to that question, but, uh, but um, I went through the, the questions of maybe I'm saving time, Maria, uh, yeah. for in that regard. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I, yeah. Sorry, maybe I could answer a little bit the question. It's uh, so, yeah, the data is very important, I think, in case of AI. But there are also AI models that generate data from limited data. So Synthetic that could be one solution, but uh, I'm not immediately clear it would apply to the particular case here. But it's really like you, you would probably, you, you probably have seen that, for example, uh, Google uh, tools generating uh, photos of other people or uh, dogs and cats, and they are not real photos. They just learn from uh, the photos feed to the models, mm -hmm. and they generate similar fun. photos. So uh, this could similar approaches could be possible in case of limited data as well. Maybe through some simulation, or so you could generate more data that could be useful. Synthetic data, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and in that regard, and it's also related to other questions, uh, don't forget the one part which is also popular right now, particularly in the, within the Iranian community, the possibilistic uh, distributions too, with, with you know, data scarcity and some judgmental opinions, you can actually uh, develop something which is called fuzzy inference systems. Uh, to translate judgmental opinions and various card information into numeric branches, which you can use to and work uh, subsequently. Good. Yeah, from Hernan Vazquez, something about demand forecasting. Is there a percentage or a percentage range of improvement that we can achieve from using a demand forecasting system that applies AI compared to another system that does not apply AI? I, I, will, I will start answering this because we have been doing a lot of work on, on uh, demand forecasting, AI, ML, demand forecasting. Uh, then uh, my recommendation is that, uh, I mean, you contextualize, you customize the way you do it during your demand forecasting. That then just, I mean, plugging and playing um, software available model is could be good, but then try to do some kind of customization about what you need to do. It's not only the software that you can bring, uh, from a vendor is how you include your features, the behaviors, not only from the data, but also, for example, exogenous factors that could affect your demand forecasting. Mm -hmm. And it's true, not always. The most sophisticated AI ML models, I mean, provide the better results on demand forecasting. There are several studies that are doing that in certain context, I mean, the traditional demand forecasting with, with the right, right setting, of course, then could be could bring very good results. Mm -hmm. But then I think that the, you, you need to work a lot in order to contextualize how to better input your context and your expectations. In the case of Dell, for example, commitment it was very important. So they were doing a demand forecasting to, and also I mean, lead time forecasting, right? And then actually they were playing the two things in, in certain context. Huh? So then this brings that the, the way of demand forecasting could be richer. Yeah, if you input and then you align even more with more features of, of that can 
um, I mean, affect demand. And also if you go upstream with other effects that can could create uncertainty in your demand realization. So at the end of the day, it is not one single recipe. So then, I mean, I think that there is no answer or, or I mean, we should not rely if there is an answer say, oh, you're gonna increase 5.5% if you apply this profit demand forecasting model uh, versus the whatever. I think it's the you. So what I we have been doing in our lab is just to, um, I mean, create automated systems that test different kind of AI ML models and then compare and contrast in order to learn not only how the each model can can better I mean uh, adapt, but also what is the best model for different circumstances or context that you want to predict. Yeah. And, and any input here from any of you? No. Okay. So thank you, Hernan. Big big regards. Um. Uh. Uh. But, but feel free to come here if you see a question that then you will feel comfortable. Um, answering because I am I am just following the queue, huh? uh, but then Jason, uh, because you are also reading, mm -hmm. um, Jason, any question you want to answer? Uh, um, well, there are some also linked to that part you were mentioned. Uh, it's it's hard to generalize to say okay every time you use uh, random forest and <laughs> this uh, uh, for you know estimating demand uh, customer demand. Um, it's always, you know, improved uh, traditional approaches uh, at this level. So it's it's very hard to generalize. Uh, what I do know is that under certain circumstances, uh, there's no way to beat a neural network, for instance. Um, that, that's, this had been uh, formalized. This had been certainly formalized. Um, mm, the, there's a huge variety of application contexts. So... I think if someone makes a book so I, under these circumstances, I do have a ranking of, you know, what's the best performance from the worst performance to the worst performance of, uh, you know, those uh, AI-based methods. This this is a very nice, um, uh, I think, a set of, 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 you know, of knowledge, put it there. But it's hard to generalize. Uh, it's, it's very hard to generalize. So I don't see any other question here uh, from my side because, uh, okay. Yeah, I think it's hard, and, and and I would say even dangerous to expect to generalize. So every context is different because your expectations are different, and your business is running in a different way. So then, be be able to put, I mean, effort on contextualizing. Tell any any question and answer from you. I see a couple of questions as to me. If so, okay. one one interesting one is that to yeah. prevent okay. ethical concern associated with AI talking oh, yeah. about race for example would it be sufficient to eliminate the corresponding information from the data ensuring that ai doesn't use the use this information i this is a good question actually because i feel like some people have this perception but this is not necessarily true because um, imagine that you even you remove the race from your data completely there may be some other information that is highly correlated with race itself. So it doesn't guarantee that a, your AI won't be using the race uh, to make decisions. So this is not sufficient. <laughs> hmm. No, I think that then this is this is great. So uh, again, thank you everybody for your time, your uh, for being with us during this one hour. Especially thank you to Jessel and Chill for your very insightful uh, contributions. Thank you also to the marketing and communication team of MIT for being with us and helping to support this. And then go to 11 a.m. today. Uh, it's a time that we have another event for my master community, but you are all invited. Okay. Thank you. Have a good, beautiful day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, guys.